Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 27th Digital Rebar Meetup. It is October 9th. Uh, we have a couple of topics. The last two meetups we've done have been, uh, we've done a lot of bug scrub and burn down. Um, and we are uh, due for some topics about things that we've been working on in the background uh, since the last release. Cool. Any community, any, Chris, do you have any, since you're the community person here, I think, the only, oh, there's Greg in the other room. Hey, Greg. Um, Chris, did you have any topics you wanted to bring in? Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Shane. Can you hear me? Now we can. Oh, wow, my microphone works. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, uh, I'm used to getting weird sound. No, the only thing I was uh, curious about is um, the uh, I started to go through it on community same thing I was doing two weeks ago I just uh, a bunch of the one project I'm working on has a bunch of um, the um, the um, oh, react stuff so and then and this other one the security guys that I was working with uh, is, ends up doing um, well they they're Basically, using cucumber to drive some of the their, their stuff that. Uh, um, what basically it looked like, uh, you know, I, the C they drive all their test tools via the command line stuff. So I was thinking about, oh, I just make a package that goes into their the they call it Gauntlet. Have you ever heard of a Gauntlet? No. Yeah. Like it's, oh, from a security perspective, I think. Well, I know, it's. Yeah. It's basically, you know, there, there's there's a whole bunch of security tools that are just pen testing. You know, they're they're basically all the, you know, the attack tools that the you know attack community uses. So they use those tools to do you know penetration testing and you know blah blah blah. I can, uh, I mean, it gets a little bit off subject. Other than I'm trying to integrate. Well, if I have to do it for them, their their eventual target is to uh, actually. And there's another company that. Uh, th they're trying to use AI to basically make the adjustments of a, you know, dynamically to an intent of a higher level pro, you know, you know, well, but some of the crap that comes out illegal, basically. Right. It's, it's interesting, but it's just, anyway, the jumping back to that, I go, Oh, they're using cucumber. Great. Cause I love, you know, to use cucumber, especially when I'm dealing with, uh, you know, people who don't want, to really look at the code at all. And then I got to say, hey, I'll just do that. I'll just, you know, I'll put that. And then I can't remember, someone was talking about the, um, the, uh, um, no, you guys were uh, trying to get it up on Windows. And I got to thinking, heck, that in, I think it was Greg that mentioned it. Oh, you know, if you, you can run it on Windows, the CLI, and then it can talk to, you know, an, a unit in it. And I was kind of, oh, maybe, should have take that approach, but if you take that that whole system and just dump it into a uh, into a Docker thing, I'm sure it will work. And I'm saying, oh, then I can drive the you know CL you know I can drive some testing and treat um, their their same approach to configuring um, the attack stuff that they're testing to configuring the network they're going to test, which leads into the DRP you know stuff. So I was going, oh, I could shove that in, and so if I if I expose it to them that, that way, they may just sign off on you know. That anyway, it's a longer shot, and it's not my you know true intent. But uh, I was just seeing similarities, and so when I so I was going to go experiment with that, just try to make, you know, the the doctor. I figure you guys have done similar things or the same thing. It's just put it all in containers and test in containers. So I went out to the you know. I looked at your Travis to see how it was going, but uh, and is this right? Um, Greg spent 
yeah. sorry, the, the Travis stuff, it only runs the go test, right? Sweet. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then, um, but then when I, I dug into some of them to, I don't know go that well, but I, there's a whole bunch of tests that you do are on. And I said, well, heck, I could just take that text, pull it up and, you know, try to do the same sort of test command line just to see if all this stuff works. And then I can use, then I can basically take some of those tests as examples to control a network for their, you know, the, 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 this gauntlet stuff that they're using. It's pretty simple, you know, the, it's pretty simple stuff, but uh, it's just trying to get a common language. And then the, the last one I was thinking, of, oh, heck, I could bubble that, um, the actual, well, the, the cucumber, the cucumber statements into the documentation and you get, you know, human readable documentation that's executable, which is another, you know, thing I always try to do, but it never succeeds. <laughs> Yeah, we traditionally rely on, um, <clears throat> at its heart, just the regular old uh, Go test suite. And the um, there's a bit of custom stuff around how the CLI tests are run that uh, we've kind of accreted to make it easy to uh, add and maintain tests for various different scenarios. So, Yeah, and that's a tr when I was starting to go through, well, I just want to pull a few up. I went up and I started pulling you know, how you test into a test that I can run out, out of the command line just to check the, you know, to smoke test things. And then I got to thinking, oh, I could just, you know, it, there could be an automated process. I don't know if that's what, but then this ties back into what I did, you know, way back in January was I was trying to extract out, and this is, I need to re look at this because you've done a lot of documentation that's embedded now. Oh how the CSS and stuff like that is connected into the, um, oh, that's, I can't even remember what that was. Oh, in the content packages, because you, your document, you putting in um, comments in the documentation of the comment package that you're actually floating to the documents now, right? That is an option. Oh, okay. uh, content packages have documents and there's some CLI helpers now that will let you build an RST document based upon the, um, well, the documentation elements inside of that content package. Well, like I said, I'm just starting to play with it. I, but my, my thinking was just to dump it all in multiple doctor containers and see if Travis would run it. As, hmm. as far as it's smoke test. Because that's what they're doing with this gauntlet stuff. They're lighting up multiple containers and just letting Travis run it. And then Travis runs the different, uh, and they have a local Travis that they're not using the Travis service. I No, they're using the, tra actually they, they use a Travis service for their open source stuff, but you know, since they're security, they're always have to, just like you guys, I'm sure they always have to build inside. So they go with a, uh, um, oh shoot, Jen Jenkins, you know, they build a Jenkins server. The only thing I don't like about their stuff is they're heavily, you know, they got a lot of Ruby and I hate Ruby. But you know, uh, well then uh, cucumber might not be the thing you want to promote. Well, yeah, there's there. But the thing is about Ruby, there's always alternate alternates, right? And most of the core stuff is not just like the only reason I like cucumber is because it uses, uh, uh, well, it, you know, it's 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 a standard web thing that Selenium uses. That geez. no one talks to me for two two weeks, and then all of a sudden everybody is pinging me. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah, no, I, well, you can't get around not using Ruby since 2005. Uh, we, we did a pretty good job of getting away from, of getting away from Ruby F over for v V3, but. Oh, no, yeah. I understand. Yeah. I, no, I, Chris, well, I, I don't. Doing work for other people. 
and they are not oh. in a certain industry. And I see what you're saying. Yes, that's right. Anyway, I'll, I'll the, the the big one was uh, if there is someone that was using those in a test pattern, I was just going to start using their Docker, you know, link off of their doc. I was going to put multiple Docker containers in a Travis and try to, you know, test it that way. And then when I looked at the Docker container, you're not really keeping a Docker artifact, or are you? I I couldn't tell. I it looked like you're pulling just a, a Docker and then loading, you know. We, we do maintain a Docker. Um, Artifact? Rebar. Yeah. For our, oh, okay. We, and people, and people use it um, for various, various things. Yeah. And I'll, I'll go look at, and I, I saw that one, but I saw a whole bunch of other Docker hub things up there that weren't, you know, I saw the one, the provision, but I couldn't, you know, then. There's, when there's I looked some at, old, there's some old digital rebar stuff. I, I never checked to see if we pulled them. And they're wow. still there. You, it's actually V2? not easy to get rid of. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's it gets all that stuff is. But the the challenge is we don't build a Docker container that just has the CLI in it. That's fine. I'll just do it. I'll I'll do something on the fly for that because it's. It, I mean, it's a matter of just getting it. You know, you just have the Docker container loaded itself, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I just didn't, I didn't know, you know, at one point Travis, you know, wouldn't do that stuff. But then when I, when they were showing me all this other stuff, I said, oh my God, they had, they had Travis doing it, you know, so I said. Oh. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we haven't. Yeah, I'll work on it and I'll get, the, the only, uh, the only big one that I was one wanting to know on is, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to avoid the the UX stuff for a while, but I was trying to get, uh, the, uh, if I get through the CLI part of the cucumber stuff, I was just going to pull, you know, that's why I went back to the, uh, the go, the go test. And I just, if I abstract those out to do a smoke test of, you know, just, you know, working with it and then it might be worthwhile because then I could do the same technique for, you know, putting in the, uh, the, the web, you know, the web, the UI or whatever, I can't remember what you call it, you know, the, uh, the fancy stuff, the pretty UI stuff. But then if yeah. I did that, then I was going to go back and try to, you know, abstract out, you know, this is back to the DSL stuff that I'd like to try. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if you just wanted to test individual pages, you could use the reference links and do that for the UX, um, but it might not give you much satisfaction. Um, as far as actually catching bugs, so I was just trying to get establish something that would link it back to the documentation, and th this is even for the CLI. I mean, it, it, same with the web API because your your CLI actually just exercises the web API anyway, correct? Yeah, this it's all well. Nothing uses the web. The, it's all RESTful, so everything yeah. uses the RESTful APIs. So, so Chris, I was going to jump us since Lewis is here. I would, I was, I was going to jump us over to ARM discussions since I know that was of interest to him. Good, I'll mute. Hey, Lewis, thanks for joining. My thought was um, we might just want to touch on where we are with ARM and the status of it, um, so that everybody can kind of be on the same page of where we're at. Um, so, um, Victor, you want to talk about what you've done and then I'll talk about what I broke and then <laughs> we're at. Okay. So what I've done for arm support so far is to get, um, teach DR provision about, uh, you know, that there can be more than one architecture that a system can possibly have. Um, uh, updated boot environments so that uh, they can be responsible for multiple architectures uh, and updated the content so that uh, we have links to working uh, 
sledgehammer images for ARM64 and uh, AMD64. Um, you know, and, until we get the more varieties of different hardware and stuff that is net bootable, those are probably really the only two uh, types of, ar types of uh, architectures we're going to support. Either AMD64 running in legacy BIOS and or UFI mode and uh, ARM64 boxes running in UFI mode. Um, and that's, that's what I've uh, developed around for now. Yeah. So I then went and added some IPv6 support for our systems. And in the process, don't have a comparable way to build um, BusyBox for ARM, which I need to be able to do. Um, and so right now, the PR requests that you can build and pull in yourself in that regard, if you wanted to play with it, reference sledgehammers that are out in the environment that you could play with, um, but... They don't have support for booting IPv6. Right. Just IPv4. Right. So uh, the point is, if you were to take those PRs that Victor put into the Slack channel and uh, rebuild DRP and then rebuild the community content, you could play with ARM, or attempt to play with ARM. Um, it just wouldn't have IPv6 support. Um, okay. And so it's different from TIP at the current moment. Um, it's on my so, list to, to build an update. So. Yeah, and I think, Greg, that you could use the, uh, the ARM64 or IPv4 enabled sledgehammer to essentially bootstrap a, uh, an ARM64 or JQ and an ARM64 um, busy box. Okay. So, I mean, I, I just built that as a, a couple of tasks that you run in sledgehammer that install the compiler goodness and compile stuff Other and put out a busy box binary somewhere. Yeah. Are there instructions to do the build of uh, Sledgehammer? They're right now in a closed repo because we're playing with redoing it as a content pack itself. And okay. so, so, so <laughs> is there a boot amp that I could download from somewhere that somebody else has built? Yeah, so that's, that's the point, is the second PR that Victor referenced is a change yeah. to the, the community boot environments to reference right. an existing Sledgehammer that will work. That's already, oh, cool. picture's already been built. Um, it just, if you're going to try and play with IPv6, it won't. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not interested well, in IPv6. So, in which case, then you're probably okay. Yeah, it Currently. won't pick you it over IPv6. Uh, once you are actually in Sledgehammer, IPv6 will work just fine. Yeah, so. yeah, sorry, let me, re yeah, that's the appropriate way to uh, rephrase. I'm, I'm reasoning you to uh, DR. Is there um, anything other than Sledgehammer that runs on the clients? Um, so there are things, but most of them are contained within Sledgehammer or with, okay, so for example, the runner and things like that, they, I know yeah, they're in the work. So the DRP CLI is already built for that. The pull request that Victor has out for the DRP side. So you'll need a new DR provision too, because it stages the runner needed for those environments so that it can okay. be pulled into Sledgehammer and run and all that stuff. So, oh, okay. Does it, does it, um, one of the uh, things I was looking at was your, um, you know, when you pull the hardware information up into, into your, uh, mm -hmm. repository, um, do you look at that to find out which, uh, architecture it is, or do you do something inside uh, Sledgehammer? So, um, yeah, depending ahead. on how you want to play it. Um, we know what architecture the system is booting, um, because, uh, Essentially, because that is that information is passed in as part of the Pixie request packet, so there, oh, there's a field, yeah, the, 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 there's a field in there to distinguish between PC BIOS um, PCs running in X or X eighty six sixty four PCs running in UFI mode, uh, ARM PCs running in UFI mode, and uh, ARM sixty four PCs running in UFI mode. So we use that initially, and then once the system is up and running. Um, we arrange for it as part of the bootstrapping process to pull over binaries for the correct architecture. So essentially we know a system is ARM64 because it has the ARM64 version of DERP CLI on it. Yeah, yeah. So um, on, on TFTP, I have to uh, uh, 
uh, install the operating system myself? Uh, um, I, uh, I, ported use, over um, the, uh, I ported over the CentOS 7 install environment to be okay. able to function correctly um, in uh, okay. ARM64. Uh, uh, for the ROC64, which is the processor I'm using, um, there's a IU fan. I, I don't know if you've ever come across that. Um, it's done Never over heard of it. For, 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 <laughs> not how many people have, unless you've got Rock 64, I guess. Um, that's that's so there is a, Yeah, so I, 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 what I'll probably do is look at how you've done it for uh, CoreOS and then um, do a similar thing for um, the IOFAN stuff. Well, I mean, we didn't do anything for CoreOS. I did stuff for CentOS. Oh, sorry, CentOS, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's going to be, you know, that's basically just all I had to do to make that work was... Uh, Instead of uh, you know pulling things from the from the AMD sixty four ISO and the AMD sixty four repositories, I pull them from the ARM sixty four version of the same thing, okay, and that cool. all just winds up working. Um, it just works. Other operating systems, uh, you'd have to consult the OS installer instructions and you know maybe write a boot in for it. Yeah. Um, and if it's uh, simple enough, you know, you might, I mean, my recommended path for ARM64 or the path that I'd recommend supporting in the future is, you know, you basically, you know, start uh, building up a good set of images and then only support doing image installs. Sure. Yeah. I mean, CentOS is, is my favorite anyway. Well, glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Currently. <laughs> yeah, this is today. Liable yeah. to change at a moment's notice, I assume. Indeed, yeah, I whatever works. Moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I'm uh, from the um, uh, the Slack channel. What I'm actually trying to do is build up um, um, a twenty uh, node cluster running uh, Kubernetes. Um, I saw Rob's um, uh, videos, which were quite cool, I have to say, um, that uh, demonstrated that kind of stuff. So I actually build up uh, the Kubernetes cluster and then uh, run Helm charts. Um, so all of that stuff you're doing at the minute, Rob, is uh, spot on for me. Excellent, thank you. Glad to hear it. I'll give I'll give you some feedback when I tr when it, when it works out of the box. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that's from my perspective. That's where we are with ARM. We're not done, so you're kind of bleeding bleeding edge <laughs> um, on this path because we still have some stuff to get it into tip and a few other things that we need to get through. Um, when I wrap up the pool stuff, I may pull in the architects, the arch stuff, because I can make it work for, AM, for AMD 64 correctly um, and for both modes. And so I may then reference the previous successfully built ARM stuff for the time being in the uh, images so that um, you should be able to do just tip kind of stuff. And okay, well, I'll give it a try. And just rebuild all your stuff, but I'm not quite sure yet. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll give it a try and see what happens. Is there, is there um, I don't know, I'm going to say the, the D word. Is there any documentation on this or a light, uh, you know, a bullet point kind of thing? Do this, then this, then this? Not for the ARM stuff, right? We we haven't got it consistent ourselves, so we haven't necessarily documented anything. Right. With regard no to notes. the flow and stuff, there's stuff in the fact about the flows and that kind of stuff. But Okay, cool. I'll try and figure it yeah. out. Yeah. With doing the ARM stuff, I tried to get things set up so that uh, it would work as identically to the AMD64 stuff as possible. Cool. That's so. good. In terms of building building out workflows and all that stuff, it should work exactly the same. You know, the caveat is you got to make sure your scripts will run on whatever ARM sixty four distros you're playing around with. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, uh, you've answered all my questions anyway. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I'm going to go and have my tea now, if that's okay. Yeah. No. Thanks for joining. Thanks for jumping in. Thank, thank you very much. Cheers now. Cheers. Okay. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a particularly UK friendly time. So. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Showing up from the UK was very nice of him. All right. What shall we hit next, Rob? Um, I have the other topics we have in here are, I, we might as well do IPv6 next.
Okay. So, um, this last gyration that you can see in tip um, added support or validated mostly existing support for IPv6, allowing uh, the system to boot, get IPv6 addresses, and then continue to operate in that mode. Um, in this case, we're going to use IPv6 um, either from DHCPv6 or from AutoConf. We didn't necessarily go into creation of static IPing and stuff like that. We're leaving that still for the Net Wrangler stuff coming. Um, but this does allow you to use DHCPv6 external to DRP. DRP doesn't do DHCPv6 or the auto comp capabilities if that's what you're using. Um, so I can show you a little bit this does. The specific use case that we were targeting to make sure it works was um, we have a customer that's looking at um, running in an IPv6 only environment, but their NICs can only do IPv4 Pixie. But IPixie actually supports DHCPv6. So um, when we redid some of our IPixie work, Victor added the ability to create a very slim mountable ISO that will run IPixie. And then you can embed into the IPixie uh, ISO a config file that you want to run. And um, if that then configures IPv6 and references a IV, IPv6 DRP endpoint, the universe can continue and operate cleanly. So if you give me the 